Uh, good morning. I'm Robert Summercrass. I'm Dean of the Terry College at the University of Georgia. And I want to welcome everyone to uh, this month's edition of our Terry Third Thursday Speaker Series. If this is uh, the first time that you've been to our uh, Terry Third Thursday or certainly our Executive Education Center, I'd like you to welcome, welcome you to this facility as well. This is uh, really our base of operations in Atlanta where we do a, a range of programs and it's a great way to keep in touch with the business community and with our alumni. Uh, let me begin by acknowledging some of the sponsors of uh, Terry Third Thursday. Our premier corporate sponsor is Bank of North Georgia uh, and I believe today they are represented by Deborah uh, Boyce and Kelly Green. Um, yes, thank ah, okay, thanks very much. Uh, Deloitte is another corporate sponsor. We appreciate their support. We have two media sponsors uh, from the Atlanta Business Chronicle. We have uh, Shelley Lewis and Joel Welker. Yes. Oh, okay, thank you. And from uh, Public Broadcasting Atlanta, uh, Harriet Hoskins Abrahal. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you to all of our sponsors. Now we have uh, another group of special guests today that I'd like to introduce. Uh, Terry is forming a strategic alliance with the Atlanta-based firm uh, Advanced Strategies and we're going to be, uh, begin to offer a new suite of executive education courses in business analysis and business transformation here at the Terry Executive Education Center. Uh, I'd like uh, Tom Couch to stand. Uh, Tom is our Associate Director of Executive Education Programs and he is joined by Richard Branton, uh, Sharon Natari, uh, Colleen Meffert, and John Schroeder. Uh, Richard is one of the uh, founders, uh, Sharon is the General Manager, Colleen the, the Project Manager, and John is the Managing Consultant of this new project that we have uh, coming uh, online with them. So thanks very much for being here and thanks for your partnership. <laughs> Advanced Strategies is a business transformation company that's been in existence for 20 years now. Uh, they've got major clients uh, throughout Georgia including Aflac, uh, Equifax, Delta, uh, the CDC and, and many others across the country. We're scheduling the uh, executive education courses for this new series to begin in October. So if you have questions about it, uh, now you've seen Tom, please uh, stop by and, and ask him about it. Uh, introduce yourself. I want to mention a couple of our upcoming programs uh, in April. On April 17th, we look forward to having our athletic director and Terry alumnus, Damon Evans, as our guest. Uh, the championship series uh, or the championship season for spring sports is fast approaching. Uh, we're uh, of course all proud of our men's basketball team getting to the uh, through the SEC championship last Sunday and now they'll be in the uh, the first uh, NCAA tournament game of the day. I guess that starts uh, 1220 or so. Uh, then there's swimming, diving, softball, baseball, so we got a variety of sports coming up and obviously we've got the spring football game coming up in April as well so this is going to be a great time to hear from Damon about uh, sports and related issues at the University of Georgia. In May, uh, on May 15th, we've got Kate Atwood. Uh, Kate is founder and president of Kate's Club. Uh, Kate's Club is an Atlanta nonprofit and it helps children and teens cope with the loss of a parent or sibling. In June, we'll have a peek inside the Olympic rings with uh, Chris Welton. Chris is CEO uh, of Helios Partners. Uh, they're an international sports marketing consultant. They've got offices in Atlanta, Beijing, and London, and their clients include uh, Olympic corporate sponsors, major sports uh, properties, and even some of the cities around the world that are pursuing the chance to host an Olympic Games. You can register for any of our Terry Third Thursdays on the website, um, or you can talk with some of our staff who are here about the upcoming programs. Uh, lastly, I want to mention uh, a big event for MBAs in the room. We have uh, an MBA reunion coming up. Um, it's going to take place uh, the weekend of April 18th and 19th. Uh, on Friday, we have a reunion dinner at the Ray Nicholson House on the uh, main campus in Athens. There's also a charity golf tournament on Saturday that will be hosted by the Graduate Business Association. 
And if you're not into golf, there are plenty of other Saturday activities. So any of our Terry Alumni Relations staff can tell you about the events and help you with any details in case you are uh, ab able to attend. Okay, now I'm going to turn the program over to Lauren Hammond. Uh, she'll be introducing our speaker. Uh, Lauren is a first-year MBA student in our full-time program, a graduate of Miami University in Ohio, and she worked as the executive, executive director of Burger King Corporation's Have It Your Way Foundation. Today's speaker served on the board of that foundation, so Lauren is an especially appropriate person to be introducing him. Prior to becoming executive director, uh, Lauren had career experiences here in Atlanta, working for UPS, uh, TNT, and CNN as a publicist and as a public relations manager. Lauren, let me ask you to come up and introduce our speaker. Thank you, Thank you Dean Summercrest. Good morning. I had the pleasure of working with Julio during my time at Burger King. While I had the opportunity to work with many executives in my role, Julio quickly stood out, not only for his leadership skills and business accomplishments, but also for his gregarious personality and tremendous sense of humor. A Terry alum, Julio has enjoyed an illustrious career. In his current role as Burger King's Executive Vice President of Global Operations, he is a member of the company's executive team and reports directly to CEO John Chidsey. Prior to this post, Julio was president of the Latin America Caribbean region, where he was responsible for the company's operations, marketing, development, purchasing, supply, and distribution. In his more than 20 years with Burger King, he has also overseen areas including franchise operations and development and field marketing. Prior to joining the company in 1984, he worked with Xerox, Southern Bell and, Southern Bell and Telephone, and AT&T Information Systems. He holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in Economics from Georgia State University, in addition to an MBA from the University of Georgia. Julio is an active philanthropist in his local community and was a founding board member of Burger King's corporate foundation, the Have It Your Way Foundation. He and his wife, Miriam, have three beautiful daughters and live in Miami. Please help me give a warm welcome to our speaker, Julio Ramirez. Thank you very much, Lauren. It's uh, great to see you again. I haven't seen you since, since you left, but uh, you're in the right place. Um, it's great to be here for, for many, many reasons. This is really, a, it's kind of an emotional moment for me because uh, I, you know, I grew up here. I'm Cuban born. Um, that's a little more, more, more people have a knowledge of Cuba if you're in South Florida than perhaps here, but Cuba is certainly the biggest island in the Caribbean and it's only 90 miles from Key West. But interesting enough today, it's a communist country and not one where, you know, may, I was seven years old when my family left. You may know another Cuban person that came through Atlanta who since passed away and he was the chairman and CEO of Coca-Cola, Roberto Goizueta. Uh, Jay Goizueta, interesting enough, uh, who's a son and works with Coca-Cola today, when I went to high school with him in Atlanta here at St. Pius X in Doraville. But in many ways, this is kind of a, this is a, this is a wonderful, it's wonderful to be here today because the area we're actually standing here, I mean, when I lived in Atlanta, I, I grew up in Atlanta from when I was seven till I finished my MBA at Georgia. And when I grew up in Atlanta, I grew up in Buckhead before Buckhead was, obviously it's very famous, that's infamous today, but it was, uh, it was just kind of a residential area when I was here. Um, I think Houston's maybe had just opened down the road here as uh, across from Lenox Square. Lenox Square was kind of like one of the few malls that I actually remember. And as a child, I remember uh, dribbling a basketball up and down somewhere between Christ the King, where I went to elementary school, Christ the King Church there on Lindbergh Drive and Acorn Avenue and Garden Hills. I lived in Garden Hills. Should have never sold that. <laughs> My dad should have never sold that. <laughs> and uh, beautiful, still a beautiful area. I always drive by it. And... Um, so this is really kind of, this was like, if people say the hood, this was kind of like my hood, this whole area between, it's amazing. I, I looked out, I was looking outside the hotel window last night at the beautiful Ritz-Carlton. I certainly couldn't stay back then anywhere near Ritz-Carlton, but I was looking out the window, looking at all the high-rise buildings just in this area. This is certainly not downtown, or there was no Midtown back then. There probably was, but we didn't call it Midtown. And it was just really impressive to see the city. What a great, what a great place. And you guys are blessed to live in a great 
Great city. I'm sure you know that. Atlanta is one of those places you you never hear anything negative about Atlanta. You have the change of seasons. Um, I have come through here a lot because obviously Coca-Cola is a, a big supplier to us. We're a big customer there. Sometimes I feel like I'm their customer of mine or vice versa. But I get through here quite a bit. And um, But it always seems to be on the run. And I always regret. I always wish I could stay that extra day, go back at the University of Georgia in Athens or whatever. And lo and behold, I'm in a building now where, I, you know, if I went to Georgia State, what an easy transition that would have been to be able to get my graduate degree at the University of Georgia right here in Atlanta, in my home, in my home area. But I loved my time at the University of Georgia. I was there pre-Herschel, but, but we did win the Southeastern Conference in 76 when I was there. We had a dual quarterback system. I think it was Matt Robinson and Ray Goff were quarterbacks at the time. It's a great just a lot of fun. I actually worked in the grocery store business with Colonial Stores or Big Star. They're no, I don't think they're anywhere to be found today, but I, I worked through my MBA and, and just had a wonderful time. People thought I was like Fraternity Fred because everybody shopped, you know, the students, the teachers, visitors, the locals, everybody shopped at the Big Star. So when I walked through campus, I knew everybody. So it was my fraternity in a way, you know, and it was a lot of fun and I really enjoyed that. And then the last thing I'll say is I ran to a guy I knew at Georgia State here that we kind of looked at each other like, you know, 30 years later, we're checking each other out to make sure it's the same person. But uh, Ned Richards and I go back a long way. And uh, I told him kiddingly, because I'm exaggerating for dramatic purpose, last time I saw you, you looked a little bit like Mick Jagger. And now he looks like, you know, corporate executive. Uh, and he and he's, uh, was a great guy, a real leader at Georgia State as well. So it was great to see Ned to see you here as well. Uh, so, Lauren, thank you for that wonderful introduction. I do love South Florida. You get used to having no weather no colder than what you're feeling out there today uh, it's nice not to have a sweater but uh but it is nice to have the change of seasons you know that's it's important to see that you feel like christmas is christmas and all that um so let me talk a little bit about uh burger king and and uh and again just know just know that i'm i'm saying it in a place that uh, where i feel like i'm home so i met a lot of you this morning and and uh, it just it's great to hear a southern accent very different than the accents we have in miami so uh, what I want to talk about today is really what I would call with great pride the Burger King turnaround and a little bit about global operations, which is what I'm running now. And um, what I would say, first of all, is uh, I think I'm the only, and I think this is a true statement, that I am the only uh, senior executive at Burger King that's been there probably more than five years. We, we have many employees that have worked at Burger King, you know, 30 years making French fries or the salad. At one time we had salad bars, the salad bar lady, the, the lady that makes biscuits. You know, there are people that have been many years working very hard in many restaurants throughout the U.S. and internationally, but no senior executive. And I don't say this with great pride. I don't think it's a good thing for the rest of the executives when you have a, a lot of turnover, starting with from, from CEO to marketing to uh, ownership. And so I can honestly say that it is a different place. People sometimes talk about the good old days. When I use that phrase, I'm really talking about growing up in Atlanta because the good old days for Burger King are today. And I mean that sincerely. I think... It's a wonderful place to work. Lauren caught a little bit of that, but we're now going on about five years of what seems like a totally different place. Um, and again, I do want to I do want to thank uh, the dean and and uh, and certainly Lauren for inviting me to attend and share with you the the story that I have to to share with you today. Um, so let me uh, see if I can make this thing work here. First of all, in case you don't know, Burger King Corporation, uh, unlike other fast food chains that started out west, Burger King Corporation was founded and it's headquartered in Miami, Florida. It started in 1954. It's also the year I was born. So I, I've always, I guess I always had that little thing going. It was founded by Jim McLemore, who has since passed away, and David Edgerton, who was a very, very innovative person who's still alive today, who's a restaurateur. He's owned, he's owned fine dining restaurants in California and quite a guy. He was the guy that actually, uh, in many ways, invented the flame broiling equipment, which I'm gonna talk about. It is the second largest fast food hamburger restaurant chain in the world. Um, in fact, I would say that it's a two horse race outside the US in terms of hamburgers. But as I like to say, it's the number one hamburger chain in flame broiling throughout the world. And I think that's a better way to say it. Uh, we, are no, we have over 13,000 restaurants in more than 70 countries, the most recent of which was Colombia, not South Carolina, but Medellin, Colombia, where we opened last Friday night to a very, uh, very successful opening there. If any of you have, have tried, probably not a lot of you have traveled to Colombia. It doesn't have the world's best image. It's actually a beautiful country. Uh, President Uribe in Colombia, people talk about Giuliani cleaning up New York. You hear that a lot. Uh, Uribe is the type of person that I think he has a 95% approval rating. 
one of the friends, one of the real friends of the United States and Latin America, and has done a great job. I mean, people feel safe again traveling. I was there about six months ago. I remember I was sitting in a in a gourmet restaurant 45 minutes outside the city in the middle of the woods, and I'm thinking, boy, if my wife knew where I was, uh, she would say, get home. And it was a, it was just great. I mean, there's that much confidence. There's there's he's had to do things like put police every five kilometers, if you will, and people can get out in the road and drive again. And it really is a beautiful. I can literally say. It is uh, the the topography of that country is like Switzerland. It's got the pine trees, the mountains. I mean, it's an unbelievable place. Not many places like that in in Latin America. So, we're hopeful there. And uh, we have 800 restaurants of the 13,000 that are company owned in the U.S. We also have company ownership in a few other markets like Canada, Mexico, which is a market. It's my second home, really. Uh, I had an office there. Germany, uh, one of our big markets in Europe, Holland, Spain, the U.K. And most recently, we opened in Shanghai. About about the same time, we opened Brazil. We have 1,500 franchise owners. Our model is a little bit different. For example, in Latin America, we typically go with kind of larger, well-capitalized groups that can develop an entire country, with the exception of Mexico and Brazil, which are very big. Uh, our model in the U.S. is a little different. We typically have, I think in Atlanta, we have about 15 to 20 different franchise owners in greater metropolitan Atlanta. Um, so the model's a little bit different, but I think internationally, where you don't necessarily have the bulk of your company restaurants, you want to have people that don't need a map to get around. They're well connected and they have the ability to build many restaurants. And on a side note, which is this is, I always have to give a plug for Latin America. We are bigger than the, the other guys in Latin America in 17 of the 26 countries we operate in together. And I think that's a real tribute to our team. And I think being headquartered in Miami helped us in that area of the world. Um, we are a publicly traded company as of May 18th of 2006. So 52 years after we started, a long time, a lot of people thought we were public before, but we weren't. We've been owned by many people, I'll talk about that in a second, but we're currently 40, I think it's 48%, uh, don't hold me to that exact number, but we're owned by a consortium of Texas Pacific, Goldman Sachs, I think we know how well they've done, and Bain Capital, another, Bain Capital also owns Domino's Pizza. Um, and as I like to say, it is the home of the flame broiled Whopper sandwich, um, which is the world's favorite burger. And I'm not just saying that, uh, but also it's it, the Whopper in a, in a way is a big brand in of itself. We've actually seen some research where the Whopper is in the U.S. is almost as well known as Burger King. It's almost synonymous, I think. Um, and I and I always have very vivid memories walking down Peachtree Road there in front of uh, Peachtree Battle Shopping Center. There's a elementary school E, e Rivers. There's a Burger King right up there. That's where I had my first Whopper. I have very, I think most people, if you talk to most people, they can remember that. One of the early Whoppers I had there. Uh, and that restaurant's been remodeled several times, but it's still there. Uh, let me go to the next uh, slide. This, will, this is just, uh, you know, kind of a flat uh, layout of, of the world. And uh, just would point out that we have offices in uh, the, the blue dots signify where we have regional offices. We handle Asia out of Singapore. There's a gentleman named Peter Tan who's ex McDonald's. Uh, has been with us for a while, doing a great job. We've just recently uh, have entered Indonesia, which is a billion people, Japan, which is you know well, well north of many hundreds of millions, and and certainly we also have a big presence in China. We're growing, starting to grow there rapidly, primarily in Shanghai, but we've opened the first one in Beijing. Somebody was talking about Beijing earlier, uh, Dean was, and uh, we have our first. It's interesting. We only have one in Beijing. Our competition has many. But ours is at the airport, so I can't wait for the McDonald's executives to go buy that one. Uh, and there is not a McDonald's there. Uh, the Latin America and the headquarters, our office, are based in Miami. Uh, and we just uh, recently opened an office in Zug in Switzerland where we handle uh, Europe and the Middle East and Africa. And we now are in Egypt, so now we truly are in Africa for a while there. We would talk about the region, but we weren't there, but we're there now. Let me take a few moments and talk about, and I tried to put it all on one page for the sake of time, but uh, what I would call the key success factors, it's really four and a half years with Burger King. And I think if I were to say what has been the primary reason for our success, I think it started with becoming an independent company. If, if any of you have followed Burger King for whatever reason, if any of you are in the financial area, we have been owned by many in many ways, and I kind of went my entire career, I went through all that. In many ways, we were like gladiators performing for the Caesars in that we were always owned by someone else, and we were kind of a cash-rich company. Um, we were owned by Pillsbury when I started the company. Macklemore at some point sold to Pillsbury, I think it's 69. Uh, we were owned by Pillsbury when I started. Um, we were then, in 1989, we were, it was a leveraged buyout by Grand Metropolitan, which is a British company. It was when a lot of British LBOs were happening in the late 80s. And they acquired Pillsbury and then separated the two. 
and they put one of their folks, a guy named Barry Gibbons, who is a friend, uh, as the first CEO of Burger King in that administration. And then Grand Met, I, I would put them in the category of they, they uh, reduced, you know, they reduced all of our regional offices. They probably brought a little bit of technology to the field with cell phones and, you know, whatever was appropriate. Uh, but we really, it was tough. I, I remember having some very vivid layoffs. Of, I think about 400 people in about a two-year span shutting down regional law. Very painful to have gone through. But you learn. You, you learn with all that. I would call those character-building experiences. Uh, and then kind of grew back a little bit. And then Diageo was formed. I don't know if any of you work in the, in the liquor industry, but Diageo is the biggest distributor of spirits in the world. And, and Grand Met uh, owned Johnny Walker, produced Johnny Walker. And Diageo had Johnny Walker, Smirnoff. Uh, Bailey's, uh, they had they had some some wineries, etc., and they happened to also have Pillsbury, Guinness, as in Guinness beer, and Burger King. So I mean, the, our partners were not exactly what I would put, you know, fast food restaurant chains, uh, but they were all they certainly were products people enjoyed, you know, on weekends and fun events. So we tried to make it work. I think we tried. I think our marketing skills probably got a little more professional at the time, but at the end of the day, it's a it's a fat the Burger King business, a much faster paced business than some of the others, and eventually they decided it wasn't a strategic fit, and then in 2002, they sold Burger King, but for the first time we were sold to financial folks, the same three companies I mentioned, and, and so I think that act alone, and then eventually going public, was I think the key that really unlocked uh, the value, because the first time we were working for ourselves, and I think that was a very liberating experience. Um, some of the other, kind of, these are not in order of priorities, but some things that I think have worked for us. Number one, we accelerated our new product pipeline. You know, clearly the Whopper is the, the, the America's favorite burger, but we needed, you know, the whole world was going premium, so we rolled out an Angus uh, product line. We got some great stuff. Now that we're a public company, I can't talk about what's happening next week, but we have some great stuff coming. Uh, but you clearly, you know, you clearly need to have a variety of products from from, you know, anything from grilled chicken, which, you know, it's one of the advantages of flame broiling, to salads, which we rolled out back then, to the tender crisp and some other products we rolled out, stackers, uh, which are basically just the concept of, you know, you can just keep stacking this stuff. I think we set a record, 20 young guys in Brazil bought a 200 patty <laughs> stacker or something like that for the record book. So we actually paid for that, which is pretty interesting. The... Um, the, uh, and we got some great stuff coming down the pike, and we're really exploring, you know, different types of consumers at different times. But the, the real focus, I think one of the credit I will give to our agency, we, uh, Russ Klein, who's my partner, his office is right next to me. Russ Klein, an Ohio State graduate, and it's, uh, it's nice that the SEC has been rough on, uh, on Ohio State, but uh, in many ways. And, uh, but anyway, Russ made a very tough decision of choosing an agency called Crispin and Porter. Crispin and Porter is not, certainly not one of the big New York agencies. That was a very... Uh, strategic shift, I would put them in the category, almost a boutique firm. They handled, uh, did some good work with Ikea and Volkswagen. But what they did more than anything is very innovative advertising, very edgy advertising. They, they brought the, I say they brought the king back. We really didn't use the king that much. I actually had a doll in my office, one of these kings that we used to give as toys. And they actually came out with the, what I call the creepy king or whatever you want to call it. But we, we came out with the king, the king that you find in all kinds of weird places. But the guys, for some reason, that stuff works. I mean, I'm not in the target audience, but... The stuff works. It's amazing the, the, how people retain that. But they really focused on the, what we call the super fan. And the super fan, of which I'm probably a prototype, is somebody that goes to Burger King, I believe that number is five times a month, which, you know, doesn't sound that bad for me, but for some of you that may be shocking. But there are some super fans that go a lot more than five times a month to Burger King. That means they go to a bunch of other places, you know, 30 times a month. So clearly, um, it's interesting, and I'll make this side comment, that while there is a concern about, especially now that I'm getting up there in age, there's always a concern about health, and you hear that a lot. I think what I would say is that it's really about a, hel uh, a healthy and balanced lifestyle. I I'm proud to say that I am, of our entire executive team, I think of our 13, I'm probably the second, in my opinion, most overweight. The rest of the group, I mean, these guys are all, because they, they work out every day, and, and I think it's all about balance. And, and so you can go to Burger King and have fire-grilled salads, you can have grilled chicken. You know, you don't, nobody's making you eat a double Whopper. It's just that once in a while, people just want to have a great tasting burger. And I think we don't pretend to be what we're not. You know, we're not. If people really are going to be on a, on a veggie diet, you know, we're not, we're not necessarily the place you want to go five times a week. But we do have, we're the only fast food chain that has, at least in the, of the major ones, that has a veggie burger. And we've had it on the menu, and it's there, and we sell about two a day. But it's on the menu. <laughs> No, and, I, and I'm not saying it to be sarcastic. I mean, I'm, I'm just saying it's, it's kind of interesting. You know, the people talk a big game, but at the end of the day, they, they do sometimes different things. So 
Um, Crispin and Porter, I give them a lot of credit in that they're uh, they use the uh, they really taught us to use the internet. They've actually, besides all the advertising that they're doing, very I would call it kind of edgy advertising, but they've done some great stuff, including on the internet, uh, the internet engaging uh, kind of the young people in a medium that they're growing up with. For example, the Simpsonize.me website, where people could send their picture and you'd come back with one of the Simpsons, kind of like well, you looking like one of the Simpsons. Uh, there's WhopperFreakOut.com. That was our latest one. And by the way, that was the highest recalled campaign we've ever done in our history. Now, I'm old enough to remember Candid Camera, but I would call it, it was like a Candid Camera uh, commercial in that people would go to Burger King. And these were real customers, and some were filmed in Atlanta, by the way. And when they order a Whopper, and these were regular, you know, regular super fans. And when they would order a Whopper, they're told, no, we don't sell the Whopper here anymore. And we kind of capture their reaction to that. And then just when they're ready to throw something at somebody, then the king walks out and gives them a great flame broil Whopper. And it's really a, so this Whopper freakout thing has been an interesting, interesting, it's been a, some amazing, there's some that are, there's some that, are, that we show in commercials, there's some that are on the website, uh, and there's some that, uh, that will never see the air, I think. But uh, these are real, there's a real, it's amazing some of the things you get called when you tell somebody there's not a Whopper there. But uh, so anyway, it's, it's been, I would say the Burking has been talked about in the news a lot. You know, a lot of, we had a time with the NFL. We're just constantly doing a lot of stuff, and it just feels very different. And we're talked about in a positive way, and, and that's just great to be a part of that. Next, the th next thing I would talk about is kitchen innovation. As you can imagine, when our biggest uh, technical strategic advantage versus our greatest competitor, who, who, by the way, is much bigger in number of restaurants and countries, but we do very well right across the street. And I think that's really, it's really about being better in the neighborhood. But uh, really, when you're known for flame broiling, I mean, 80%, I think, uh, if you survey across the U.S. and in many countries internationally, how do you want your hamburger prepared? 80% say flame broiled. And I think the other folks just didn't really think about the question much. But clearly flame broiling is the preferred way that people want burgers throughout the world. I mean, if you go to Latin America, uh, you know, and any of you have eaten in a uh, Brazilian restaurant, you know that they cook over fire. In Argentina, they have churrasco. So whatever, it, it's the way people eat beef. So... We, are, we have actually, uh, based on that, we are actually, as we speak, and we're about 20% of the system has already rolled out, we're actually finally, after 45 years, we're rolling out a, what I would call a more advanced piece of equipment that allows us to cook something thicker than a Whopper or a hamburger or a grilled chicken patty. We can actually cook steak. We can cook a lot of different things on this new piece of equipment, which is I'll show it to you in a second. But uh, I believe that this, and, and then there's some related uh, materials that go with that that you need in order to hold more proteins in the restaurant, et cetera. But it's a big investment, but franchisees are gladly doing it because there's also utility savings with the equipment. So, I mean, this thing is, is a win all the way around. The next thing I would say is continuity and leadership. And I'm not there. I'm not talking about me. I, I'm sad to say that I am the longest, I think by at least 10 years, I'm the longest running senior executive. But the good news is I now have 12 other executives that have been there five years and uh, four and a half years. And I think that's, that feels good. It feels good for the employees. It feels good. Again, it's not that any of us are rocket scientists. I think sometimes in life just having – Somebody who's pretty good um, year after year. You can build relations when you're 90% franchise. Franchisees then don't become the keepers of, of the history of the experience. You know, in, in many ways, our franchise owners are the ones that kind of held us up when, when changing CEOs were going on. And so many times it was the franchisees that carried the torch forward. And in many ways, I think they see me as a franchisee because I grew up, I was kind of like a, what I would call a farm system player in a, in a, in a place that had traded for, for professional resumes at all levels and i think it's nice to have that continuity i, I just think it's a big big difference um john chidsey who's my boss came from sendant if any of you know that company he was in, in the uh, uh hotel business services district uh services business great great boss great balance of he's not a micromanager but he knows the right questions to ask very inspirational great with relations and he's just made all the difference he was my boss in my old role as well as president of latin america and yeah, he probably went to Latin America more in two years than the previous six CEOs went their whole their whole career. And I think he was just fantastic. He is fantastic. So um, one other key thing was reduce building and equipment costs in North America. You know, as you as you well know, the the real estate costs, in spite of the fact that we're having issues in subprime issues and, and, and real estate prices residentially perhaps are dropping a little bit. But the but being in prime locations in urban cities throughout the world is not getting any cheaper. And the cost of building is not getting any less, and energy costs are not getting any less. So we really needed a building that folks in the U.S. who had gone through a lot. We were, I would describe our franchise community in 1999 to 2001 as war-weary. I mean, it was just tough. Uh, we, were not, we, we were not the best-performing fast food chain at the time. And so our sales dropped to the point where we actually had many restaurant closures 
Uh, some were probably bad locations because we went through a, uh, many years of opening restaurants wherever, and I think now we're being a little smarter about where we open. But having a low-cost building, which we call the ROC building, R-O-C, return on capital, uh, has actually been a good thing, and I think in the U.S. in particular that was very needed. Now, you go abroad, I mean, if any of you could fast forward to what we've done in Germany or some of the countries in Latin America, you would be very, very impressed and very proud to, as, as an employee, you'd be very proud of seeing the Burger Kings we've built. And uh, a, a, a little trivia that you need to know is in the, fa the fast food business in the U.S. and the big players is about 65% drive through So in many ways, the design of your restaurant is really insignificant compared to how quick you give somebody the food. A lot of the, particularly breakfast, a lot of that is eaten, believe it or not, in the car, if you can believe that. I'm not sure with a Blackberry and a croissant, uh, how safe that is, but the reality is people people are doing that, right or wrong. And so, um, but we are trying to, we're e even discussing initially maybe doing some uh, image enhancement to our current building. I think every every six or seven years you kind of need to freshen up and be competitive with the Chipotle grills and the, all the other concepts, you know, Star Starbucks certainly and many other type of restaurant image that's out there. The, the last couple things I would say and is that the BK, BKR way is kind of like, you know, if have it your way is our brand positioning and if uh, flame broiling is our technical strategic asset, I think that having a, a, you know, culture is one of those things that you don't just pass out a few posters and expect everybody to feel good. I think it comes by living it. And so I think this BKR way culture is what I would call, we really have focus on leader-led training, meaning that we ourselves as executives uh, teach certain classes uh, and, and live that. And... Uh, a company called Sendelaney, a consulting group out of Arizona, really helped us with that. And we eventually, the, what they trained us with, we're, we're rolling out and using it internationally. But it's all, I would call them just simple concepts that work from the, from the boardroom to the restaurant. And uh, so we're really getting behind that, and it's been a huge success for us. It's infectious when you live it. But you have to stick with it, and I think having management continuity helps as well. And then the last piece, which is really important in my new role, is that and I watch this from afar, being in Latin America, is for the first time we have consistent global metrics. You know, if you, don't me if, you don't, uh, if you don't measure it, then it must not be important. And I think we were measuring our business differently all over the world. And I think uh, my predecessor, a fellow named Jim Hyatt, and, uh, and a few other folks around him that now work for me, uh, really uh, developed some pretty good metrics that we're using globally. And, uh, and we quit the flavor of the month stuff. And I'll talk about that. So we quit the flavor of the month stuff that was happening when you had changing leadership. So... That's my longest slide, so bear with me here. Let me talk. This I'm not. This is just an eye chart, but it just shows you all these little, like I would call them, kind of like biological components here. Uh, these were just any one of these inconsistent ex execution, limited metrics, limited guest focus. All these things were kind of like the Burger King of old. And basically, you know, our strategy in the last five years has not changed. I mean, we have the foundation of the measurements I talked about, the platforms, which I'm going to talk about in the next slide. Uh, restaurant capabilities, technology, I've talked a little bit about that, and then the culture, and, and really that has led to some very solid execution. So this is a chart that we put up all the time when we meet with our, uh, with the investors in our business and, and many other folks. Um, but that strategy is steady. I mean, there's there's been very few changes, a few tweaks, but nothing significant. And this is actually one of my favorite pages because, you know, operations, I know this from personal experience, it's always very exciting when you're president of a region. You know, it's always exciting to talk about new country entries and show pictures of restaurant openings and beautiful restaurants and commercials. When you're in charge of operations, everybody says, yeah, operations are important, all that, but by the third slide, people's eyes get a little glazed because, you know, operations is really about kind of like boring is good. You've got to execute flawlessly, but it's tough to brag about it. But I can tell you I am bragging about it because I think, I think that what we have done as a company in the last five years is great. We actually have three platforms, and what I like about these platforms, as opposed to programs, is that they have withstood the test of time, and they're easy to understand. When you can explain something to folks from J.P. Morgan, notice I select my company as well, from J.P. Morgan to crew members from Alpharetta, uh, you can explain clean and safe and the importance of that. You can explain hot and fresh, and you can explain friendly and fast. And I think everything we do really falls on those three things. And, 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 and really at the center of the plate, and it is in the center here, is hot and fresh. I mean... Uh, we do seek progressive. People always ask me, what's the one thing you need to do to be successful? It's not one thing. It's a few things that you need to continue to, to focus on. But hot and fresh is at the center of the plate. And what I mean by that, you already heard my comment that we're the number one chain in flame broiling. Food is in our name as opposed to some other competitors we have. that It's in their name. But we're Burger King. We're the king of burgers. Uh, we're not X. Um, uh, we have a heritage, obviously, of flame broiling. I think the Whopper, in spite of all the mismanagement, in the old years, the Whopper still the number one burger, so they couldn't incompetence couldn't destroy couldn't destroy that. 
And now that we have good management, I think we have the opportunity to put some cousins and brothers for the Whopper there to make it a better place. Um, I've already talked about flame broiling. I think the investment. Uh, so it's easy to ask franchisees to invest behind the hot and fresh platform because they know it's important to us. Uh, we've actually rolled it out with some other stuff, a, a piece of equipment called the Kitchen Minder, which sounds like something you might have in your, in your kitchen, Lauren, when you're preparing dinner or whatever. But the Kitchen Minder is nothing other than it's just something that tells you what to cook and when to cook. And it's a very simple way. And it also gives you a grade of how well, how well your team is doing, holding the, the what we're doing what's called batch cooking. So you, you can hold the protein in a place where you can keep it for a certain 15, 30 minutes, but you don't have a finished sandwich there under the heat lamp, if you will. You have products that you prepare when it's ordered. Made to order is a big initiative that we're doing with the Whopper specifically. So, you know, a lot of that stuff has really resonated with, uh, with our own team and I think with the final product. The other thing I would say is that we are embracing technology that, ad that adds assist and ops simplification. I don't know about you guys, but stepping into this job, I, I think that sometimes in our, in our zeal to have great technology, uh, I think we really complicate life for the, the poor people running our restaurants, which are a challenge. You know, it, it, this is not, it is not an easy business to have. Some of you may have seen there's a chain out there called In-N-Out Burger right out, out west. And I think their whole menu is probably what Burger King's menu was in 1954. It's like, you know, instead of Whopper, it's, you know, Big Burger, whatever they have, hamburger, cheeseburger, fries, and shakes. That's it. That's their entire menu. It's a little bit like Johnny Rockets, but at lower price. And the lines are out the door. And they take 12 minutes, and you wonder why do people wait, you know, 12 minutes to just eat what we already have been serving, and we have a bunch of other stuff on the menu. And I think part of the answer is, is, is I think people want simplicity. And what you find out if you understand in and out is that there's kind of a cult behind people. I want that burger, you know, fully dressed. It's kind of like the var. I compare it to the varsity. You know, at the varsity, you order burgers with all kinds of secret codes. No, I'm not sure what they are, but there, there's a secret code language there, and in and out is the same thing. So the thing is, if I were to say to my management team, okay, guys, we can have 12 minutes speed of service, we, we, would get, we would fail because we're a mature brand. People have certain expectations about Burger King and our competition that we can deliver a great tasting Whopper, fries, and a Coke for under three minutes. And I think we do that. And I think uh, some of the new uh, cult brands can take all the time they want because they started that way. So it's, it's all about managing expectations. We don't have that luxury, so we have to do it all. We have to give you a great product quickly and and if you come inside it's got to be a nice place even though you're probably on the run so but technology i'm sure you feel this way technology is almost uh it's becoming a little bit overwhelming i mean there are i think we'd agree if any of you have a blackberry i mean there's a piece of technology that i think has made our lives a little better as much as your spouse might give you a hard time of why you're looking at your blackberry instead of talking to her but but the reality or your friends or whatever you know there's a concept there's a concept of be here now that sometimes you struggle with that but but the reality is, man, you get home, you get, you get back to the office from being on the road, and you're caught up on all your emails. I mean, that's a big time saver. You don't have to stay late. So I try to sell that pitch once in a while at home. Uh, sometimes it works. But, uh, but that's what we seek. We seek really the BlackBerry of many of the things we're doing at the restaurant level, because I'm not sure we've always been able to find that. We've thrown technology that's not always easy to operate. Uh, credit cards, for example. You know, most QSR grocery stores, you yourself, you're using credit cards more than ever. But there's a whole series of technical part behind that, you know, from the cost of using credit cards, if any of you have dealt with that. It's not just what you pay MasterCard. I mean, there's a whole kinds of bills and stuff associated with that. So, and the process by which you get approvals and all that, there's some technology there that you have to be careful with. So one of the things we're, we're doing is trying to get broadband in our restaurants. We're trying to get a POS system, a point of sale, uh, you know, cash register system that, that can work quickly and do a lot of stuff, technology to make life a little easier, touch screen and everything else. Um, we now have one agreement with Chase currently in the U.S. for what we call pay it your way. We're not doing pin debit yet, but we're working through that. We're actually in an RFP for the, for the next generation of that. But all of these things, if you don't manage it thinking as a restaurant manager or, or more importantly as the night manager, which is a, a difficult time, or 20, you're hearing a lot about 24 hours, our competition has gone to, that's an area of opportunity for us. I think our competition is a little further ahead on the 24-hour part of life. We live in a world where it's not a nine to five anymore. There's a lot of different times where you need to be open. But, but you all, I guess what I would say is you always have to be sensitive to who are the folks that really use your technology and how can we make life simple for them. The, the next piece I would say is continue to focus on cost reduction. I already mentioned the issue of real estate. Uh, one of the areas that report to me in my new role is global supply. Uh, we're doing, I, I, this is a plug that I will say for some of our success. We learned in 1994. Today we, we just passed McDonald's. Uh, we have 375, don't hold me to that exact number, 375 restaurants in Mexico. We just passed McDonald's there. They started before us. Um, and, and that was nice to come from behind. After six years, that they started before us. We have passed them. 
But in 1994, if any of you do any business in Mexico, you know there was a huge crisis in Mexico, uh, and that affected people's lives down there because they were holding a, a peso that was worth, or yeah, three pesos was a dollar. It went to six pesos to the dollar. You can imagine all of a sudden what, what, you're, what you could buy out of what you had in your wallet. And uh, I learned very quickly that the importance of our success internationally was to have a global spec for our products, but try to have local suppliers wherever you can. Now, you can't do it in every country, but to the point where we opened Brazil. We were late getting into Brazil, but it's a huge story. We opened three years ago, but when we opened, 80 percent of our products were made in Brazil. Today, 93 percent of what we make in Brazil is, is made, of what we have is made there, including stainless steel, menu boards, uh, everything except this broiler I'm talking about and a few, and a few other items. But uh, to, th to this day, very successful opening. We came, you know, the only player in town was McDonald's. They have hundreds of restaurants, but we had very good partners. We now have seven franchise groups in 15 areas of Brazil. We're in 15 cities. We've opened 42 restaurants. They're averaging about $500,000 more per store a year than, than the U.S. And they're most of them in food court, so we can open them easy. McDonald's did not have exclusivity in the mall, so we've been able to get in there quick. And, you know, we will have pretty shortly, I mean, again, I can't give you the number because we're a public company, but it's growing very, very aggressively and, and doing just fine. But it was the learnings, the pain of the learnings of international that I think is, is helping us to formulate how we grow internationally. And just very quickly, just to show you some of the results, every year, every one of these lines going across, we do something known as guest track. It's, a, it's an outside. If any of you have been to Birkin, you may see, I'm not sure everybody's looking for the thing, but we have on the back of the receipt, there's a 1-800 number to call to tell us about your experience. And, and uh, we've been doing this guest track now for five years, but you can see, actually the top line is not a national number, but the blue line where the circle is, we actually had, a, that was January, February, which we just got in, we were at 52, so an all time high for guest track and overall excellent performance. From, these are from customers calling in, it's about 30 customers per restaurant throughout the US. And so you, and we have a pretty good system of knowing if somebody's calling from the same phone number, we've eliminated pay phones, I mean, like any system, you can game some systems, but, but that's not the situation here, I believe. And, and so, but this is one of the many measurements. The top line shows you how our better performers are doing. So certainly we, there is upside. There are folks that are getting 57s and 58s, but, but our national average is the highest it's been in four years. Um, our, own, our own measurements, the Operations Excellence Review, that's, I have a team of people globally uh, that are called OESs, Ops Excellent Specialists, who do, it's like an audit function with more of a teaching and coaching type mindset, but it's different from the guy that handles the relationship with the franchisee. It's not the, uh, not the account executive. It's more of a, the kind of nuts and bolts measuring all the three platforms I talked about. But again, uh, you know, the op performance is at an 83. Again, the top line is our highest performing group, the top 20%. You can see that there are folks that are 90, but 83% were an all-time high. So again, that's our own measurement, but we're, pretty, we're fairly strict um, in, in how we look at this thing. This one is the opposite. This one you want to get lower. This is kind of a golf score. This is a little bit of speed of service. I mentioned to you that in the U.S. our business is primarily drive-through. When you go internationally, with the exception of a few countries, sorry, with the exception of a few countries internationally, the bulk is in, in the restaurant. But in the U.S., speed is, is utmost importance. But in, uh, if you look down here at F08 in this like pink, pinkish color, uh, we're at 157 seconds. It was the lowest we've been. I think last month we were 159, but we were at 159 going up against 162. For, for that time of the year, it's the lowest ever. So I think we're on three and a half years of always having lower score than the previous year in terms of how many seconds through the drive through Now, it's not all about the drive through One of the new areas we're getting into, this is a really interesting piece, and I'm sure you can, uh, you can sympathize with me on this, and that's the issue of friendliness. It's very easy. People know that you've got somebody visiting from the corporation, or so we think it's a surprise visitor, but who knows? By the time one restaurant gets hit, that manager's probably calling the neighborhood saying, hey, the guys, in, the guys are in town. So you don't really get too many torpedoes off if everybody knows something's going on. So, but the bottom line is this area of friendliness. People can turn on a smile to perform for the audit, but the reality is this is trying to get beyond that. We're really trying to get at what it, because that is the essence really is you don't want to feel like a number when people are going through a drive through So we're using what's known as the boomerang effect, which is that you want to get a reaction from the customer, that it comes back to you. So, for example, if Lauren comes through in her in her uh, convertible BMW, is that what you drive? Right? When you so you when you go through the drive-through, if that cashier would say something like, "Hey, nice car," so it doesn't mean that every customer they're going to say nice. By the time you say nice car to the fifth person, it gets routine. But to try to get some type of a dialogue going, we're really doing in about not eight but seven of our markets, really trying to get what does friendly mean? You know, we talk about friendly and fast, but a lot of the focus is on the fast part, and I think friendly is the key. 
one example I will give you, and I, I've always acknowledged competitors when they do well, Chick-fil-A. By the way, I had my first Chick-fil-A in Atlanta when I was a kid at Atlanta Stadium. Before there were Chick-fil-A restaurants, there was Chick-fil-A sandwiches in the aluminum pouch. And what a great product that is, right? And, and I think they're closed on Sunday and do $2 million. I mean, a great chain, great service, you know, and I think they're a real model. A lot of what we're, we don't just look at the hamburger business. We look at all kinds of folks. And so we're trying to emulate from some of those folks. This, I just want to show you what this broiler looks like. I mean, this is about a $7,000 piece of equipment, but this only has like eight, nine moving parts versus the current broilers throughout the world is about 40. It has to be cleaned every night. It's a lot of work, but this thing's easy to clean. But the initial capital cost, Duke is the company that makes this stuff, you know, no relation to the basketball team. Go Georgia. Initial capital cost, energy costs have been reduced, maintenance costs reduced, cleaning costs reduced. The kitchen miner is like, it's actually, it's a little bigger than a Blackberry, as you can see. That's the actual size, but it, it kind of shows you, you know, it just helps you to manage your inventory. These, this two innovations have been very well received by our community. Normally, franchisees, they're not, you know, they don't have a checkbook ready to give you more money besides the royalty that they pay you and the advertising. So you really have to, it has to be something that they see value on it. And I think we're about two more charts. This one just shows you that the OER, the audits that we're doing, they're global. But you can see how in all of our key markets, the U.S., England, Germany, Spain, Puerto Rico, Mexico, for example, we're at 85. Uh, we have common metrics, and we actually do a lot of calibration sessions to make sure that an 85 in Mexico is the same as an 85 in Huntsville, Alabama. And so that's been a good thing. And then the last thing I'll leave you with, and I'll be glad to open up for any questions, and, and I appreciate you. I know... I know I, I'm into this fast food stuff, so I'm, I've probably gone more than you want to know about it. But, but our ops metrics, I, I would say that this balance, part of my job is also the balance between global and local. We have four presidents, and my, I would be like the fifth, me and the marketing guy are like the fifth and sixth president. But we, we work with the four presidents, and, and I'm, I'm really at, the, at the, junk, the junction between what's global and what's local. You know, because at the end of the day, if, if a region is not performing its metrics, you know, usually they're not, they're not out to fire the guy that's in my role. Usually that region president's got to deliver real, real results. And so I'm very, having done that for my whole life, I, I can empathize with them. I think that's part of why I'm enjoying this job a little bit. I know what they're all up against. Part of my job is to help them sort out, okay, what's global and what's local. And I think that uh, there is a balance. But ops metrics, for example, are global. There's no reason to be measuring operations differently. You might be sensitive that the drive-through, you might need a few more things for drive-through in the U.S., but it's a little different. You have to have a great hostess program, for example, in, in Argentina. The brand positioning is global. So you'll see Have It Your Way is what we use, but we have different, slightly different commercial. The King, the Creepy King, or whatever you want to call it, doesn't work that way everywhere. Uh, but we are using the King in a few places in pretty in interesting commercials. Uh, flame broiling is certainly uh, global. The, the Whopper is global. It's a star of our menu. Coke is our strategic partner, but while we do not have Coke everywhere because there have been longstanding relationships with Pepsi, the other player out there, but... Uh, uh, you know, Coca-Cola, clearly through the years, it's a company I've worked with quite a bit that's headquartered not far from here. Uh, and I do think we have a question I always get is, what's the menu look like? And I would say that we're about 90% 90, 90 to 95% global menu, but we do have local options uh, that are relevant. You know, in, in Brazil, we offer some soft drinks that they drink down there, flavors that are unique. In Mexico, we have jalapenos. Uh, we have more snack items in certain countries, but we try to be relevant. And where we have tremendous flexibility because people don't wake up in a foreign country thinking about dessert necessarily at a, at a fast food place or breakfast. So we have people, you know, when you serve breakfast in Chile, people are eating Whoppers for breakfast because they're thinking this is, the bird, this is a U.S. experience. So they think you guys are all eating Whoppers at 9 o'clock in the morning. But the bottom line, it doesn't matter. We do those very well. But we're now offering, we do offer local breakfast of what they eat because it's important, you know, it's important that if they're not coming to us to, to have uh, uh if they want to have lunch in our restaurant, that's fine. But if they like to have breakfast, we're open anyway. We're using the light bulbs. Why not serve something local? So we do have some local breakfast flexibility. We've rolled out a Mexican breakfast uh, where the croissant in Mexico, for example, have like spicy uh, peppers and stuff in the egg and all that. And uh, we're also piloting delivery. I thought that was an interesting thing as well. We're actually delivering in, in many countries. It, it's not always safe to be driving around at 10 o'clock at night. So we're doing some. Uh, you also don't have all the insurance issues you have in the U.S. So. You can use motorcycles, uh, walk-up delivery. We, we have the ability to hold cold food cold and hot food hot. I think you've heard that concept before. So we've got delivery in about seven countries throughout the world, Turkey, one, and a lot of Latin America, and our competitors do it as well. So you have to compete in four areas, you know, eat in, take out, drive through, and delivery. So that's all I have. I tried to give you a flavor of a lot of different things. Um, hopefully, you, uh, hopefully you got a sense for what my world's all about. But uh, 
I wanted to open up. I, you know, the one comment, I mean, I would, be, I would be remiss if I didn't say, for those of you that are students, I know you have a couple here, I, I do think that um, I enjoyed very much uh, getting my master's degree for many reasons. I think I enjoyed being in Athens, but I, I definitely enjoyed the, the University of Georgia program. I, I, unfortunately for me, I, kinda, I guess it was good because I enjoyed it and I had a part-time job as well. But I did my MBA right after undergrad, my undergraduate degree. So now that I've been in the business for, you know, 24 years, uh, I know many people have, have especially in a, in a forum like this, can get their master's many years later. And you can really know what teachers are talking about and really lived it. And I think, uh, you know, so I always tell people, don't, don't get discouraged if you're having to do your MBA at night because, you know, you're going to get more value out of it. And it's going to sometimes it's that master's degree that if you're not really happy in everything you're doing in your job, that master's can kind of rekindle some some energy. Uh, in learning again and, and maybe be the thing that makes you, you know, maybe do something else at some point or be better at what you do. So that's all I have. I don't know if there's any, any questions uh, about anything. And, you know, I, I'd like to think myself knowledgeable of uh, the industry as well as Burger King, but I appreciate the time this morning. Thank you. Thank you. My name is David Monsoor. Um, yeah. First, I actually do remember the first taste of Whopper I've ever had. <laughs> uh, it's weird when you said that, that I remember it being eight. And, but anyway, my question would be, um, you said that, I guess, management was not as good in the past as it is today. Yeah. What would you say the, six, the change is, is for fast food? Because for me, is it all about a new marketing gimmick? Is that the, when one company is up? Yeah. Or what else would you contribute <laughs> to that? I would say, uh, first of all, let me give you some Whopper cards before you leave, but that's, uh, I appreci appreciate you doing that. I assume you still will have a Whopper once in a while. Uh, first of all, let me just say that uh, I, I do not believe, I, I do believe there are business cycles, but I, I, I think, I mean, we're going through, in spite of the economy, we're actually going through a very good time now. There was a theory at one time that of the three players, only two would do well at the same time, and and. You know, I don't know if I subscribe to that in that the, the, the competition is not just in the hamburger category. I mean, especially internationally, we, we consider our competitors closer in to be also KFC, Pizza Hut, and many others. But what I would say is the following. I think there are many chains. Uh, Wendy's had a nice run, for those of you that follow their stock. Wendy, and, and not only, it, it's not just a stock either. It's the performance of the company. But I think the Wendy's performance for eight or nine years was very strong. They were almost down and out 20 years ago. Uh, and then they had that whole where's the beef, Clara Peller thing, and they came back, they actually came back very strong and uh, had a very nice run. They're going through some tough times now, primarily some ownership struggles, but uh, very good performance there. McDonald's has had a huge number of years performing. They also had struggled, but they're doing well. Uh, I think that our biggest problem hasn't been, I would not call it management incompetence as much as just changing management. I think that when you're owned by different divisions, it's just often too easy to just fire somebody. You know, the hard thing in life, and I, and I realize at some level, you know, as a CEO, I mean, you, I mean you're not going to change a CEO much. You're not going to do a lot of coaching to your CEO. But it's not just the CEO. I mean, we turn, turned over ad agencies, marketing people. Um, besides the normal change that occurs, I think, in, in corporate America and internationally as well. But I, I think just the consistency of management. There are, Let me tell you, there are people that work at Burking through the years, even when we were having bad years, who've gone on to have great, you know, great careers because – Again, it's not really about how bright one person is. I mean, I, I really think it's about the team, how everybody works together. So I think it's a combination of, of, of continuity. I don't believe that, that it's all about uh, you can only get four or five years and then the cycle's going to be down. I mean, look at I mean, Starbucks recently ha had a problem with Starbucks for years. I mean, it was amazing the performance they've had. You've seen that Howard Schultz, the founder, I can only imagine what it must be like to work for the founder. That's got to be tough for the founder to come, come out of retirement and come back. I mean, it's got to be like a till of the hun there now. Uh, but you know, but you know, I mean, he's talking about going to, you know, fresh beans. I mean, he, he, he will get it right because that guy, that guy lived, he has a lot of passion for this thing and he'll get it right. But I think they had huge growth and very successful brand. They created a third place away from home where people feel comfortable to uh, hang out, especially young people. And I think that uh, it's just been amazing what they were able to do to the coffee business. I, I think, that, so there's no reason, there's no preset number that this cycle will run out. I keep pinching myself because the previous positive runs we had at Burger King. We had, there was a two-year run back in 94, 95, where we had kind of a back-to-basic strategy. We made our Whoppers bigger and focused on the Whopper Valley meals. In the 81, 82 time period, we had the Battle of the Burgers, where we, I don't know if you remember that, we had kind of made poke some fun at, at our competitor. 
in a light-hearted way, and it worked out very well. But that was a two-year thing. But I think what feels good about this is just you know you just have this very robust thing and continuity. I, I know the plans for the future. It just gives you a very good feeling that we're on the right track. And I think, like I said earlier in my slide, it's it's a combination of those seven or eight things. I think that's been the big difference. Yes, sir. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, we opened at 17 uh, about a year and a half ago. We dropped down to 12 along with the market when it had to drop a, a couple months back, uh, and we're trading at 27, 26. Uh, and, that's, and that's been when the market has taken some real deep dives. So I think I, I give a lot of credit to John Chidsey that he is CEO, but he's almost like, I would say he's 75% he's chairman. I mean, he, he and Amy Wagner, who's our investment relation, I mean, they are always talking to our investors, and I think they do a great job of explaining our business. I think he's very candid. I think I think one of the things about Johnny's very candid. I think that's what it's all about. It's about being transparent. You don't need to, you know. It, it's not about creating any smoke and mirrors because that will catch up with you. I think it's about saying things like, "Hey, we know McDonald's is in 100 and something countries. We know that, you know, they have thousands of restaurants in countries where we're just starting. So if you consider that we're the only other player out there and we have a strategic benefit versus them, you can just kind of work do the math. So it's as simple as that, I think. And now there are challenges, obviously, but. I think that, and I think in the U.S., I think it's very competitive. I mean, there's seven or eight, not including any local folks like Diversity, there's seven or eight people selling hamburgers throughout the U.S. and also competing. But I think we're, you know, we're, we're finding our way, which is great. Yes, sir. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the great things about Burger King, and I, uh, I got to spend some time working for him. I thought you looked familiar. I'm thinking, is it Jimmy Johnson or who? who why does he look oh, familiar? No, no, no. It's not Jimmy I remember the Ramon Morale and yeah, Jerry it's a good friend. and all those guys. Good friends. Uh, the technology and the advantages that Burger King has had over the years, the company was founded on it. Yeah. The, the Edgerton designed the chain link broiler. Right. The limitation, as it turned out, was the inability to do batch cooking. Right. How is this new broiler? Because that's very breakthrough. Yeah. Able, I mean, how many can you cook at a time? Because when Max came out with a, with the clamshell. Yeah. I mean. Yeah. It made I, I think. Enormous well, I think the the as I pointed out here, I probably went through it a little bit fast, but that was probably good good for you guys. I'm, but the the Duke broiler, it's only one of two. We have two flex broilers. We we like to give folks a choice. Um, it's also good to have a couple of people, offering you know from a supply standpoint. We use Nico as a company based in San Francisco. Uh, and Duke is one that, that does some other equipment with us. But basically, all it is is the ability to, it, 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 you kind of, you batch cook. You know, it's almost like if you remember, you know, cooking something in the oven when you cook biscuits at a time. It's like you'd actually cook eight burgers at a time. So it appears to when you first see it, you go, well, how can that be faster than when I'm sending hamburgers through the, <laughs> through a chain? And the answer is because you're cooking eight at a time. So, so maybe the other one's off to the races quicker, but then boom, you drop eight and they're done. Uh, and you also have multiple chains. So you can, and now in the, in the, Duke, you cook eight at a time, and then you store product, and you can store product up to, you know, 15 minutes in its own environment with juice, if it's beef, whatever, but it's not fully assembled. So it's unbelievable. I mean, the taste is great. Uh, it eliminates a steamer, which is a piece of equipment we have that used to kind of like provide steam. It's it, as opposed to microwave. It's kind of it steams it and gives it a – so, but you don't have a steamer because you're making to order. I think that's it. So the taste of the product is great. The Nico, on the other hand, is the same chain broiler, but you have several chains, so you can cook – different products at the same time. So both give you that capability of, of and also cooking thicker burgers, you know, because I think you're not limited, you know, the, the broiler, if it didn't fit in there, you know, I've, it's funny, since I handle international, you, I've seen all kinds of stuff being sent through the broiler. And, you know, when, when you see somebody pushing a, 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 a rib through there, that's where you, okay, time out. That's where the global local party ends, you know, so, um, so this new broiler will give us the capability to cook much thicker stuff. I and mean, we actually have We've had some meetings, what we call Menu of the Future, and it's been amazing, some of the stuff, you know, that, that we've tried. Steak, we have a steak sandwich in Argentina. It's unbelievable. And uh, so we're trying to do some of that. I think that that's also good for, like, in the evening, you might want to do something different than, than a hamburger or whatever. So we're looking at different things. So. we got time for one more question. Okay. Good morning. How you doing? Uh, in reference to global expansion, what are some of the key components and questions uh, you ask yourself or your company and some of the data you look at to decide should we enter into this new market and yeah. this new country that we haven't entered into before, yeah. whether or not your competition is there, or whether or not they're not. Right. That's a great question. I think that's one that we, we're constantly discussing. I think, you know, and since you're a public company, growth is very important. So you, you, I would say, number one, you have to make sure you grow in your existing countries where you have opportunities. That's your easiest 
growth. And if you've got the right business model, you want to make sure you're growing in the Germany's, the Spain, Mexico, Brazil, once you're open. But I also think at the end of the day, I mean, the world, you know, the world is changing right before our eyes. You know, who would have, who would have thought the euro would be where it is today relative to the dollar? And, but I will also tell you that one of the, one of the few but great things about, about the U.S. is that people love our, our culture, our food, our entertainment, our fashion. And I think, I think fast food and hamburgers are part of that. And I think part of it is because people want to do that. Part of it is because I think the world's not going any slower. I think people really are trying to maximize life on both ends of the, you know, this whole 24-hour mentality. The, the concept of the global teen, if you've read any, any, anything about that, that you know, teens around the globe are beginning to look very similar from the iPod to what they buy and what they consume. Who's our user, you know? And, uh, but I think number one, you know, you, you just want to make sure, I think it's, it is about your competitor because our competitor, fortunately our competitor kind of has provided some lights of where we should be going. Uh, but it's also about uh, scalability. Uh, you know, for example, when you go somewhere like, and we're not in Russia or India, for example, those are two, I mean, India, believe it or not, India has 900,000 Muslims that consume beef. So there are more people that eat beef in India than people that, that there are in Mexico, for example. A lot of people don't think that. Now, there's also a billion people that if you put a hamburger in a restaurant, they might torture your restaurant. So you have to, you kind of have to weigh those two things, you know. So, so for example, McDonald's, McDonald's does not serve, I don't think, they don't serve beef in the restaurant. I think they serve a bunch of other stuff, chicken or, or whatever, whatever they're allowed to serve. But it ain't, it ain't a hamburger as you'd classic. Flame broiling gives you permission to cook a lot of stuff that flame broil a lot of different things. You know, I mean, we've, we've done grilled vegetables and been able to do that. So. Uh, but I would say there's plenty of near-term countries that we're in that there's a lot of growth opportunities, for example, in Brazil, in Europe. Eastern Europe, we're making some headway in that. They're, they're big friends of the U.S. You know, I think Poland, uh, you know, just today I was reading the paper, they're sending troops, you know, right or wrong, you know, right or wrong, whatever your stand on the thing is, they're supporting the U.S. and they're sending troops today. And I was in Poland two weeks ago, and, man, they love, they love uh, all things U.S. and they like Burking a lot. So we're looking at many of the countries in Eastern Europe um, but I think it, I think it is about scalability. I think if you're going to open a big country, for example, like like Russia or Brazil, one of the things we did, one thing I did not say when I put the map of the globe, there are a few countries. Franchisees have their own offices in Atlanta. Every franchisee has his own office. But I'm saying in in countries where there's no company restaurants, we typically don't have a Bergen Corporation office. The exception are Singapore, Switzerland, as I showed you, but also Brazil, because it's a different language. It was Portuguese. We were there a year before we opened. And we really had to have the, the people on the ground that could do, I had like one person of every department that could speak the language, knew the, knew the lay of the land, if you will. And I think if we were to open Russia, we would have to do things like that. But clearly, you have to go where the money is. You have to go where your competitors are going. I think that's clearly a sign. But you also have to make sure. And by the way, flame broiling is preferred from Mongolian beef, you know, to Kobe beef. I mean, it's all over the world. I mean, it really is there. And Asia, I think, is a perfect example. We're doing very well in countries that you wouldn't necessarily think are big beef consumers. So. I think we're out of time, so thank you. If the dean didn't get me off here, I'd be here all day. I love this stuff. This is what I do. <laughs> Julio, thank you so much for your remarks and, and for being a, a, a terrific representative of our Terry MBA program. Um, uh, appreciate on behalf of the uh, alumni board and the Terry College you coming and speaking. And we'd like to offer you this uh, token to remember today is a glass sculpture by a local artist, Ben uh, Benzunas. So. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate that. And for all of you, uh, please come back next month as you're leaving. Remember, uh, Terry Third Thursday is your pass out of the parking lot. So I'll just mention that to the uh, the guard as you exit. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Let's stay in touch.